apologize first of all if you have trouble hearing me. I, uh, I didn't expect my voice to go, go quite so fast today. Uh, after the, it, it must have been the preaching so long this morning. I, an, extra, an extra 20 minutes and killed me, I guess. No, no I'm just kidding. It's uh, just a little uh, inflammation in my throat. But uh, other than that, I feel, I feel great. I feel a whole lot better than I sound. I, 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 I sound like death warmed over. I, I feel like a million bucks. I really do. Uh, I, what a blessing it was. The one thing I, I regret is that I couldn't sing. Like, I can't. As everybody else is singing the praises of God, even as the choir was practicing earlier, I, I, I tried to sing. And, and the looks that I got um, or, uh, told me to stop. <laughs> and then they told me to stop. <laughs> uh, but but the, I, I miss being able to, to, to sing the praises of God. But what a blessing it is to, uh, it doesn't change the, uh, doesn't change the message of the songs. And what a blessing it is to be able to hear people singing. And normally I, I, I've got a big mouth. I won't hide it and everybody knows it. I've got a big mouth and I can't hear anybody else but myself. Uh, but it's a, it, what a blessing to be able to hear our church lifting up and, and praising God tonight. And, and uh, it's as much as I dislike not having a voice, uh, it sounds very well, very good. Uh, I do appreciate uh, the blessing of, of God. And if I'm going to lose my voice, I would rather lose it preaching the word of God than anything else. Uh, I could tell it was going this morning as I was preaching, and I didn't care less, honestly. I was just glad to be able to share the word of God. So tonight we're going to continue, and, and we'll, uh, as long as my voice holds out and the Lord tarries, we're going to finish our uh, looking at, at the, the letter Q in our, in our study. This is our third week on it. Uh, we only have a few of the questions left, but these are, are questions that are often answered by new or young Christians, and, and, and we've preached about all of these things uh, that we're going to cover tonight uh, at some one point or another, uh, but it, it is good to, to, to know uh, not just... Uh, it's good to know the answers to these things and not just that I heard a message on this once, but that I can go to scriptures now and I can prove to, to somebody, I can prove to myself, I can remind myself of why I stand firm in this position. Not just because the preacher said so, not just because of the denomination says so, but because the word of God says so. And how much more important it is that we stand on the word of God than on the denomination uh, or the name on the sign or the, the preacher standing behind the pulpit. Uh, we should follow the Word of God. Again, uh, I know that we've already covered it twice, but uh, just to, as a reminder, uh, in talking about questions, uh, uh, it is good to question, amen? And it's good to, 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 to have questions and, and to ask questions. And you can come to me and ask a question if you have an honest, sincere question about the Word of God, or, or, and I'll, I'll do my very best to answer it. Uh, I can't guarantee you an answer right then, but I know where I can find the answer. Amen. And, and we will look in the Word of God and I'll, I will do the very best I can to give you a scriptural answer. But we do want to be very careful, and again, I'm just touching this quickly, uh, but that we don't come up with foolish and unlearned questions. The Bible warns us in 2 Timothy chapter 2.23 2, and tells us to avoid those things because they gender strife. Listen, if, you're, if your reason uh, for asking the question is so that you can prove your point or so that you can, uh, you can uh, all that's going to do is cause trouble. And that that is not a reason to ask a question. Uh, the reason to ask a question is that we can know what the Word of God says upon something so that then we can apply that thing to our life, that truth, so that then we can then live what the Word of God teaches us, not, not so that we can cause any strife, any contention. Because the Bible says that we're to be united, amen? That we're to be unified in the Spirit. There's one Spirit, there's one Lord. We are one body, amen? And uh, so that, that is the reason. Uh, uh, and uh, again, uh, one last thing. The Bible is what has the answer. It's not me. And it's not some guy on the radio. It's not uh, uh, any TV preacher. Uh, but it's the Word of God. And that, that is where we go to for our answers. <laughs> All right. So to save my voice as much as I can, we're going to get right into it. <clears throat> the first question that we're going to cover tonight is, is it possible for me to reach a stage of sinless perfection? There are some that believe, and, they'll, and we can go ahead and turn to 1 John. First John, 
I believe it's chapter one. It's, this isn't in my notes uh, from this, but it's a wonderful place to start with it. First John, chapter one. I believe it is. Uh, I, have to, I have to look at it. Where is, where is it? Uh, Verse 8, if we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us, is a, is a good answer to this. Uh, the verse that I'm looking for, uh, I can't remember it off the top of my head, it says that if the Spirit is in us, uh, then, there, uh, then, then, then there will be no sin. Uh, and many people take that, uh, they, they, miss, they miss, see this wasn't in my notes, and I need to follow my notes. Uh, uh, no, the, 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 some people say that, well, that we can, that we can arrive at that point, that, there, that if we're a Christian, that we, that we shouldn't sin. I've heard it taught. I, I, I've heard people preach it, but the truth is the Bible also says we have to take the whole of the Word of God, not just a, one single verse. And the, the whole of the Word of God shows us that Christians are going to fail. Every Christian is going to fail. Uh, brother, uh, brother Dan mentioned in 1 John chapter 1 verse 8, if we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. Uh, we still carry uh, this flesh that we have. Uh, we can't, we're not going to be rid of it until the day that we were, that, until we get to heaven. Look at with me to Galatians chapter 5, verse 17. Galatians chapter 5, verse 17. It says this, For the flesh lusteth against the spirit, and the spirit against the flesh, and these are contrary one to another, so that you cannot do the things that you would. Understand, although we have been saved and God has given us a new, a new nature, uh, we are a new creature, and yes, it does say that all thing, old things are passed away and all things become new, I still have this flesh. I, I will be changed one day. Uh, 1 Corinthians 15, we've, been, we've recently, in fact, last Wednesday we covered this. Uh, one day this body is going to be gone and I'm going to be heaven and I'm going to be free of the temptation uh, that, that I now have. I'm going to be free from the one thing that holds me back from serving God uh, without, without anything, uh, without temptation, without struggle, without strife. This is what holds me back. This body, the lusts of the flesh. And the Bible here says in verse 17, the flesh, the lust, the flesh lusteth against the spirit. Uh, and it says that they're contrary one to, the, to another. My old nature and my new nature are butting heads all the time. It's, it's a constant battle. Uh, Paul says that the things that I would do, I do not. And the things that I do not, I, or that I would not, I do. And, and what, he's, what he's talking about is that fleshly, that fight, that battle that we have all the time. And, and can we attain perfection when we get to heaven? And that's honestly, when, we, when we're free of this body. Uh, now the Bible does say that we are to be holy. He says, be ye holy, for I am holy. It says in the Old Testament, it says in the New Testament. That doesn't mean we aren't, we aren't to strive. Listen, we should never get to the point where we're okay with just living a sinful life. We should say, well, one day I'll be perfect. No, we are to strive every day to, to live a righteous life. The verse we read this morning in, uh, in uh, uh, 1 Corinthians chapter, <coughs> excuse me, verse 15, chapter 15, uh, I believe it's, uh, it says, awake to righteousness and sin not. Uh, listen, uh, the, the Bible says we are to mortify the body, uh, we're to mortify the flesh. We're to put off the flesh and put on Christ or the works of Christ. We, we, that, get, that means we have an option. It means we don't have to sin. And, and it, is, it is easy to, to, to come into this, well, I, don't, I, I just don't have strength or I don't have the ability to overcome this. Well, the truth is we all have victory, amen? We have victory through Christ. Not through ourselves. Uh, we have victory through Jesus Christ. And the Bible says it's, it's, it's through our faith in him that will overcome the world. It's our faith in him that will help us to, and his strength and his might that will help us to overcome whatever temptation that there is in our life. In fact, God promises that we won't be tempted above that which we are able, but that we'll, he will always provide a way in which we can escape. The problem is most of the time we go in blind to the escape route and just looking at the temptation. If, our, if we're always looking, if we're always seeking to, 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 to escape that temptation that will always be there, right? Uh, we, carry, we carry the flesh. My, my, 
I'm on a diet and I'm trying to be healthy. I carry this body with me. When, when I see something that I hunger for, I still hunger for it. So, so what do I do? I, tr- I should try to find a way to escape those things. Listen, if I know that something is, is, is going to tempt me, I should avoid it. I should run to it. I shouldn't hang around it, but I should be able to try to get away from it. Let's look at uh, 1 John chapter 1. I want to read a few more of those verses there in 1 John chapter 1. But that battle, again, is, 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 is between our flesh and, and, our, and our spirit is continual. Uh, Paul had it. We... We think of Paul as a superhuman Christian who never did anything wrong. Does the Bible record Paul making a mistake? I actually think that it might. When, he's, when they're arguing over Barnabas, and, 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 uh, not Barnabas, he's bar- arguing with Barnabas over John Mark. I think they were both wrong in the argument, so much so they split. Now, I will, I will give, them the, I give them the fact that they, they did that for the reason because they didn't want to hurt the ministry. But why couldn't they resolve their conflict? Maybe, I don't, maybe, I don't, I'm not going to say he was a proud person, but what did God say he gave him the thorn in the flesh for? To humble him and to keep him from becoming a proud person. Listen, we, it doesn't matter who it is. Every Christian has the, 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 the possibility of falling into sin. And... and, and even though his sins weren't recorded for us to see, like David and Abraham and, and Moses, and he was still a sinful man. The only one who ever lived in this life that wasn't sinful was Jesus Christ. And, and he was made to be sin for us. So, and I didn't get to that this morning, but it says that he, when he comes back again, that he'll be without sin. And I praise God for that. He's already, it's been nailed and finished to the cross. Anyways, that's a different message. And I need to save my voice. <clears throat> First John chapter 1. Verse 8 says this, If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar, speaking of God, and his word is not in us. My little children, these things I write unto you that ye sin not. And if any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ uh, the righteous. Listen, we, uh, we, we... the Bible tells us, teaches us that we will sin and gives us this opportunity. Now, if we sin, what does that do? Do we lose our salvation? Well, of course not. Uh, the Bible teaches us that we're kept by the, the Holy Spirit. We're not kept by ourselves. The Bible says we're sealed unto the day of redemption, that the Holy Spirit is, is the earnest of our, uh, of, of our redemption. So, so, so it, we weren't saved by ourselves. We're not kept by ourselves. We're kept by God. The Bible says that, that, it's, that, uh, that we are in the hand of God and no man can pluck us from his hand. Uh, we cannot lose our salvation, but we can lose fellowship. In fact, the, the first part of 1 John uh, that talks about joy in the fellowship with God. And when we sin, what do we lose? We lose the joy of our fellowship. We lose our fellowship. Now, how do we regain that? Well, 1 John 1 9 tells us. If we confess our sin, now that doesn't mean we say, well, Lord, I sinned again, I'm sorry. And then, well, Lord, we did it again. Listen, that's not, truly, that's not true repentance or confession. Uh, uh, that, what we, it, 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 God desires a contrite heart. And as a child of God, when the Holy Spirit convicts us, should we be contrite? The danger is that we never get to that, that, uh, that, that place of contrition. That, that our heart becomes hardened and we can hear the preaching of the word of God. We can read the word of God over and over. We can, we can hear it week after week after week and it never touches our hearts. Listen, if we can hear the word of God and we can hear the preaching of the word of God and it never touches, I'm not saying you have to come down to the altar. Uh, if, you, if you need to, come. You can pray in your seat and get, to, get right with the Lord there. But if you can sit there and never be touched by the word of God, ever, your heart's gotten hard. The Bible says that it's callous, that it's seared. I don't know if you've ever burnt your hand or not. As a kid, we were in a, my mom remembers this, it was a horrible burn. We were at a bonfire with our church. Had a, kind of like we do a yearly bonfire. I went out to the Marshall's home, and one of their sons was my older brother's best friend. And everybody's around the fire, and I'm a kid, I like fire. So what do I do? I sit by the fire and I throw little sticks in the fire. Did that for probably half an hour. And I reached down and I saw this, looked like a big stick. I'm like, 
I'm going to throw this in the fire. It was not a stick. It was a piece of metal. It was a metal rod about the size of my hand. And I wrapped my hand around that and instantly had second degree burns on my hand. If not third, it was awful. And I can remember sleeping with my hand in a jug of water all night long because it, it, it burned so bad. And finally, I, I, when I, when I, a couple of days later, it, it had gotten hard. You ever had a burn get to that point where it's just the skin is hard and eventually peels off because it's all dead? That's, that's all dead. That's what my hand is looking across my hand. My whole hand was like that. Our heart can become that way. I could hit there. I could have stabbed it with a knife and it wouldn't have felt a thing because uh, it was hardened. And listen, when our hearts become hardened to the Word of God, that is a, a danger for us as Christians. The or God called the Israelites stiff, a stiff necked generation. And that was the same, very same reason, because their hearts were hardened. Uh, uh, so, uh, but who was it that he was calling that? Ye vipers, ye stiff necked. It was the righteous, wasn't it? The self-righteous, the hypocrites. The, Jesus was calling the, the Pharisees this. They thought they were fine. Why? Because their hearts were hardened to the word of God. Their hearts were hardened to the truth. Can you all hear me? Am I loud enough? Okay. All right, just making sure, because I can barely hear myself. <laughs> I sound different, that's for sure. It might be better. Who knows? All right, so let's continue on. <coughs> Romans chapter 7. Romans chapter 7. If you notice, I have some tea up here. I traded my addiction for coffee for tea. I'm kidding. That's not. I'm, I don't drink that often, actually. Romans chapter seven. I can quit it whenever I want to. <laughs> oh goodness. Romans chapter seven. I want to look at verses fifteen through twenty-one. There we go. <clears throat> it says this: For that which I do, I. I allow not for that, for what I would that do I not, but what I hate that do I. It can be confusing, so let's read it slowly. If then I do that which I would not, I consent unto the law that it is good. Now then it is no more I that do it, but sin that dwelleth in me. For I know that in me, that is in my flesh, dwelleth no good thing. For to will is present with me, but how to perform that which is good I find not. For the good that I would, I do not. But the evil which I would not, that I do. Now if I do that I would not, it is no more that I do it, but sin that dwelleth in me. I find then a law that when I would do good, evil is present with me. And this is just a reminder that we always have this flesh. This is Paul speaking. This is Paul telling us of the struggles that, that he has in his flesh. This is God revealing to us that each one of us has this same struggle. So how do we overcome this? How do we get to the point where, where we can put the flesh to the side? How do we get to the point where we can walk a righteous life? Because as a, as a child of God, shouldn't that be our desire? Shouldn't our, it be our desire to, 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 to be right with God at all periods of time? If the word of God is open to us and we see something shouldn't it, that is in conflict with the way that we're living our life, shouldn't it be our desire to then do that and set aside what we've already done? Yes. So, so how do we get to that point? Well, as Christians, the Holy Spirit is working in us. He's sanctifying us. But if we don't let him work, we can limit what he's doing in us. No, he'll change us. It's a promise. The Bible says that he's sanctifying us. He's cleansing us. But look over at Galatians chapter 5 again. And I know we just preached on this a few weeks ago, but we'll hit it real quick. It says, This I say then, walk in the Spirit, and ye shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. For the flesh lusteth against the spirit, and the spirit against the flesh, and these are contrary one to another, so that you cannot do the things that you would. But if you be led of your spirit, you are not under the law. Now the works of the flesh are 
manifest, which are these. We won't read through them just to save my voice. Get down to verse 22. But the fruits of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. Against such there is no law. And they, their Christ, have what? Crucified the flesh with the affections and lusts. If we live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. How do we know that we live in the Spirit? Are you saved? Then you live in the Spirit. Your life is in the Spirit. If you live in the Spirit, then you will not, then you will walk in, then we should walk in the Spirit. Will every Christian walk in the Spirit? No. They should. That's what we've been called to do. But is every Christian walking in the Spirit? Well, the Bible says in Acts chapter 6, when they were choosing the deacons uh, to to, to help deal with uh, their their issue uh, of the the people not being taken care of, he said, choose you out seven men of honest, uh, good report, full of the Holy Ghost. Uh, Walking in the Spirit means you're you're filled with the Holy Ghost, being led by the Holy Spirit in your life. Well, if they had to choose from among the church, and that was one of the requirements, that tells me that there were many in the church, or some in the church, that were not full of the Holy Ghost. Uh, uh, There were some that, that, yes, they were saved, and yes, they want to do right, but, man, they were still under control of the flesh. What did Paul tell the Corinthian church in in, in, uh, 1 Corinthians chapter, uh, chapter 2, I believe? You're carnal. He says, you're carnal. Uh, what does the word carnal mean? Of the world. Not in saying they were lost, but they were allowing their flesh to control them. Uh, the, the, and and that, that's what caused the strife. That's what caused the disunity. Right? Uh, so so, uh, so uh, how do we overcome it? By walking in the flesh. Or walking in the spirit. How do we walk in the spirit? By submitting to the spirit. By crucifying our flesh. As Paul said in 1 Corinthians 15, we talked about this morning, I die daily. Listen, it's a daily choice. That I'm not going to, uh, listen, every day I get up and I have to decide what I'm going to put in my mouth on, uh, on this. I, I've, been, I've lost like 15 pounds and we're working on losing a whole lot more than that. But every day I get up and every time I sit down at the table, I have a choice to make. I can eat whatever I want or I can eat what's healthy for me. And what, you know what I found? As I cut out those things that aren't so healthy for me, I don't really want them so much anymore. I begin to want the the more healthy things. Uh, Until last Sunday when I was eating nothing but fish and chicken, I wanted anything else but fish and chicken. I ate that for three days, like literally, that's all I had. It was awful. Uh, And it was exactly no salt, no nothing, just fish and chicken. Uh, I don't want to see fish for a while and chicken, that's that barbecue sauce or something. I'm just kidding. Uh, But what I found is that I, I don't desire those things. There was a birthday cake back there today. My flesh said, I want a piece. My mind says, no, you don't. And then I saw somebody else eat it, and I said, I'm going to eat it. And I had a small piece. I didn't eat a big piece, but I had, it wasn't even half a piece. It was like a quarter of a piece and a small thing of ice cream. My flesh is still there. still wants that stuff. But what, what did I do? I fed my flesh, and I didn't feed my spirit. There's, a, there's an old illustration. I, uh, there's no illustration. Uh, if you have two dogs in a fight, uh, one, you starve one, feed the other, which one's going to win the fight? The one that you feed. Here's the question. Which do you feed, your spirit or your flesh? And listen, we live in a world where our flesh is fed every single day. You can't turn on the TV. and You can be watching the most wholesome show on the TV and what pops up in between that, uh, some the underwear commercial. Or, uh, uh, listen, I've got, I, we got Netflix to try to t- control some of that stuff and, and Hulu so that we can, listen, it's, they're popping up there. You, you can't hide from this stuff. You, you get a magazine in the mail and like, what is this? Uh, uh, so somehow along the line, my wife got a, 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 a Sports Illustrated. I don't know how it happened. It starts showing up. I, I walked in. I said, honey, I, said, I just threw the magazine away. She goes, what? I said, the swimsuit edition. I didn't want to bring it in. I just threw it out in the trash. Because that stuff pops up. Every, we didn't even subscribe to it. I don't know how it came to my house. It's in my wife's name, by the way. Uh, but <laughs> and she hates sports. Uh, listen, this stuff is everywhere. You can't walk down the street. You can't even go to Walmart without seeing things that you really don't, that don't do anything but feed your flesh. 
So if we're, we're sad, it's like, live, it's like being a fish in the water. You can't get away from it. So if we're saturated in the world, what do we then need to do to overcome that? We need to saturate ourselves in the word of God so that we feed our, our spirit, and our spirit will enable us to, to overcome the flesh, the way we'll be able to put it aside, the way we'll be able to die to our flesh. Titus chapter 2, verse 12. I thought we'd be quick tonight. I'm guessing we're not going to be. Titus chapter 2, verse 12 says this. Teaching us the denying ungodliness and worldly lusts, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world. We, God has a desire for us uh, that we should live soberly, righteously in, 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 this, in, this, in this world, in godly in this world. The Bible says that bodily, I've been wanting to preach on this for a while, but bodily exercise profiteth little. Listen, that doesn't mean it doesn't profit at all. As a, as, a child, as a child of God, as a servant of God, I need to take care of my body so that I can then serve God in the best way that he should, would have me to. If I die of a heart attack at the age of 41, I pray that doesn't happen. But if I die, then I, because of my poor health, that's on me. That's on me. I want to serve God for as long as he'll let me. Amen? But that doesn't mean... That, we, that should be our focus. Our focus should be what the rest of us says, bodily exercise profit little, but we should rather exercise ourselves unto godliness. What does that mean? That we be more and more like God. Uh, that, we, that we become more and more like Jesus Christ. And that means we live more and more like Jesus Christ. That, might, that, that means we might have to turn some of the TV shows that we watch off and not watch them. That means that we might need to, 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 stop, uh, to, to stop reading certain books. Or hanging out, or going to certain places. Uh, uh, listen, I'm not going to tell you that you have to do this, 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 and this to be a Christian. What I'm saying is, let's compare ourselves to the Word of God. And what I've seen uh, the, the the world do uh, in the last 50 years, and I'm not 50 years old, but the history of, of of what how things have changed and where the world is now to where it was, and that was that was the world. Man, it begin, makes me begin to question. Okay, are, am I just happy and okay with where we're at or should I then seek after and see what God would have me more to do uh, or, or should I just say no I'm fine well no we should always seek to be godly and live righteously God's desire is that we live a pure life alright so that was the first question we have two more to go <laughs> oh good boy what should I do about my worries Listen, we live in a day and age where people worry. Uh, it's, it's, it's very common. Um, it's very common. And there, there are people that, 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 have, that are, are so anxious that they're on medication. Now, I'm not saying that. And listen, some of this can be caused by, by hormonal changes and, and problems. And, and, and some of this can be caused by trauma in your past. And, and listen, I, I get it and I, I understand these things. Uh, but what, what, what is worry? If we break it right down, what is worry? It's a lack of faith. Now, uh, understand we're all growing. None of us have attained. I'm not saying that there aren't times when I was worried or that I worry. Listen, I got in the car in the middle of a, a blizzard last Wednesday. Or two, was it Wednesday that we had the blizzard? Or Tuesday? Last Tuesday night, I got in the car uh, with Hannah in the back seat going, <laughs> I was terrified. I, didn't, I wasn't sure what was going to go on. Uh, I, you know, I, I had this inkling in my brain from my paramedic past that she had croup. And, and croup can be uh, helped. It's inflammation of your vocal cords. It could be why I'm talking like this. Uh, it's inflammation of your vocal cords and your airway. And it can swell up. It can swell up tight. And one of the, one of the things that treat it, you just take them out into, into the cold air. And, well, we had plenty of cold air. And, and I thought, well, I can just take her outside. But if this gets worse, we're... On a good day, 20 minutes from the hospital, if not farther, and if an ambulance is going to come out, it's you know it's 20 minutes before they get here, or 15. And but in this weather, it's going to be twice that. 
So I, I, and I told Jess, I said, listen, I'm just going to load her up in the car at midnight and, and take her in. There's four foot drift across our driveway. I backed right through it and praised the Lord for Jeeps and, and drove through the snow at 45 miles an hour listening to her going, <laughs> I'm like, Lord, you need to get us there. I keep us safe. But in my heart, I'm worried because I love my little girl. I don't want anything to happen to Hannah. I told him, hey, I'm going to pray for you. I prayed for her. We're driving along. I couldn't hear her anymore. He was like, hey, are you okay? She's sitting directly behind me, so I can't, I can't see her. And I said, are you okay? Nothing. Hannah, Hannah, did you fall asleep? Are you okay? I'm okay, Daddy. Where did this come from? Well, partly the cold air, partly God answered my prayer. By the time we got to the hospital, I was wondering why we were there. We sat in the waiting room for 30 minutes, and I almost got up and walked out because she was playing and having fun. I mean, seriously. She loved that trip to the hospital. She got, uh, they, they gave her a, a steroid to help with the swelling in her airways, and they, 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 they gave her a steroid mixed in chocolate syrup. Well, she got chocolate syrup at midnight, or actually about 1 2 o'clock in the morning. And then they gave her a popsicle. She had a blast. But understand, I had worries on my way in. I'm not saying that, that listen, none of us are to the point where we, we, we don't, where our faith is so strong that we don't ever worry. But that's what worry is. It's a lack of faith. Because we have a big God. We have a God that can make my little girl breathe again. We have a big God that can take care of whatever it is that we're worried about. Listen, whether it's financial, whether it's physical, whether it's spiritual, we have a God that, that can cover it all. But we worry because we're human and we're flesh. So the question is, what do we do? Look at Psalm chapter 127, verse 2. What should I do about my worries? By the way, she's been fine ever since. Amen. Of course, she's been sleeping in my room. I keep sneaking in my bed, so there is that. Psalm chapter 127, verse 2 it says, It is vain for you to rise up early, to sit up late, to eat the bread of sorrows, for he giveth his beloved sleep. And what's it talking about? It's talking about somebody who's worrying. It's talking about somebody who to, 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 gets caught up in, in these, uh, these thinking. What happens when, you, when you're laying awake at night? You begin to think of the, the problems. Uh, those things build upon themselves. Amen. Uh, they, 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 the more you think about it, the worse it gets. And uh, It says, eating the bread of sorrows, a vain for you to rise up early, to sit up late, to eat the bread of sorrows, for he giveth his beloved sleep. Listen, uh, when, when we're eating the bread of sorrows, when we're just caught up in whatever problem, and, and honestly, most of the things that we worry about never come to pass. I mean, we can be concerned about something... I got an illustration. I'll give it to you in a minute. It just popped into my head. But listen, this stuff never comes to pass. And those things that do come to pass, God allowed it to come to pass. He had a reason for it. Whether it's to strengthen us, whether it's to grow our faith. But understand, uh, it, the Bible says it's vain for us to worry of those things. It's, it's worthless. It doesn't do anything to worry about those things. Romans 8, 28, you don't need to turn there. We all know the verse. All things work together for, uh, to them who, no, I'm going to misquote it, so let's turn to it. All things work together to the, the yep. I know what it says. I just can't, my, my brain and my voice are connected apparently. I'm losing my voice. I'm losing my mind. Hey, hey, you don't have to say amen to that. <laughs> it's all good. Romans 8, verse 28 says this. I'm going to read it this time. Romans 8, 28. All, and we know that all things work together for good to them that love God and to them who are called according to his purpose. Uh, now understand, uh, uh, does God love you? Yeah. In fact, God loves you more than you love yourself. Does God want the best for you? In his love for you, is he going to do anything to you that will not benefit you in the end? Now listen, there are things that happen to us. Uh, there, are, there are things that we go through that aren't pleasant to go through. 
I've had multiple surgeries in my life, and none of them were <laughs> pleasant, but they're all for my benefit. I can remember as a child having to take medicine and hating it. Oh, this awful, horrible medicine. Uh, it tasted it awful. Didn't like it, but it was for my benefit. We had a doctor, I had allergies as a kid, I was allergic to dust, and we had a doctor, and every time we go to the doctor, he, I can't remember his name, uh, it's, it wasn't, it was uh, Latin or, or Spanish or something like that, uh, but uh, he always lied to me and said, the shots don't hurt. It doesn't hurt, it's just a needle. And I called him a liar to his face. I said, you're lying to me because I know it hurts, you gave it to me last time I was here. And I hated that doctor because he always lied to me. But listen, it was good for me as much as I hated it. The things that happened to us sometime were there for a reason. Uh, James chapter 1 says to count it all joy when we fall into diverse temptations. What are those temptations? They're trials. Things that, we can, that can cause us to worry or to fear. But the reason he does that is, is, is they're found in the same verse. But we're to count, uh, count it all joy uh, because the trying of our faith works with patience. Uh, he's helping us to grow. He's helping us to grow. Uh, where is a lack of faith? Uh, look at Romans chapter 14, verse 23. Romans chapter 14, verse 23. It says this. And he that doubteth is damned if he eat, because he, that's not the verse I want. Oh, whatsoever is not of faith is sin. There it is. Uh, that, that's the verse they pulled out. Listen, uh, it all comes down to do we believe God or not? And the, the better we understand how big God is, the better we understand who God is and how much he loves us and cares for us, the more faith we'll have in him. Listen, I wish we were all his children. And I can remember as a child jumping off the, uh, off the counter to my dad's arms. My kids had that same faith in me, even Elijah, which is terrifying to me because he's not easy to catch. But listen, uh, it's, uh, listen it's, uh, they, they, they trust me because I'm their father. They, they don't believe that I would ever do anything. Uh, and I'll, I'll do the very best that I can, but I'm not perfect. There's going to be a time when I, when I fail my sons. I'm terrified. And there, in fact, there's already been times when I failed my sons and my, and my daughters. Uh, daughters, we're not having any more right now. Daughter, sons and daughter. All right, again, losing the voice, losing the mind. All right, so there have been times when I failed them. But we know that God has never failed his children. And, and knowing that God has never failed his children, then what is worry? It's just a lack of belief, or a belief that God could fail us. Well, God might let me down this time. We wouldn't say it, but that's what it is, isn't it? And the Bible tells us that the, 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 the lack of faith is, is, is sin. Now, again, we, we, all, we all sin, and we all struggle in this area at some point or another. I'm not going to sit there and tell you that you're an evil, wicked sinner because you worry sometimes. Sometimes that's just our makeup. It's the thing that we struggle with. We all have things that we struggle with, but that doesn't mean that we shouldn't ask God to strengthen our faith. That doesn't mean that we shouldn't strive for that. 1 Peter 5, 7 tells us this. Is Ezra in here? Ezra. What's 1 Peter 5, 7? Casting. Amen. He's, he, he's been working on that verse for a while. Listen, uh, we can, the Bible says to cast all our care upon the Lord. Listen, uh, what that means is when we get those worries, we leave it to the Lord. It says, why? Because he cares for us. We know that he's going to take care of us. My goodness, what a blessing that is. What a blessing to know that we have someone who loves us and cares for us, that has never failed us and will never fail us, and we can cast our cares before him, no matter what it is. Whether, whether it, again, whether it's a, 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 a big or little, he cares enough that it's his desire. The Bible says that, that, uh, that a sparrow doesn't fall from, from, from the sky without him knowing. Listen, if something's bothering you, you don't think the Lord knows that and cares about that? Of course he does. Philippians chapter 4. You knew we were going to come here. Philippians chapter 4. Maybe you didn't, but I did. 
Verse 6 says, be careful for nothing. What's it saying? Don't worry about anything. Uh, that, 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 those words, be careful for nothing, is, is not, to, not to, 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 to be worried or cautious about anything. Uh, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your request be made known unto God. And the peace of God, which passeth all understanding, shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Listen, as we, as he, he's telling us not to, 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 to worry, not to be afraid, but instead lay our request at the feet of our Savior. And then he says, he'll give us the peace of God, the passage to all understanding. I, I have seen people that have had peace in, in some of the most troubling times, and you think, wow, how do they get that? God gave it to them. Because they, they took their, their fear, they took their worry, they took their request, they laid it at the feet of Christ. They, they laid it at the feet of God, and they asked him. Now that doesn't mean sometimes we don't pick him back up again. And sometimes we do that. So what do we do when we get to worry? And listen, if, if we're careful, we'll catch ourselves. So what do we do? You go back to Christ, and you lay it down again. And you ask him to strengthen your faith. And to help you some more, help you grow in this area. Sometimes the troubles that we go through are to strengthen our faith. Sometimes the things that we go through that cause us to worry, that cause us to fear, are there for the purpose that we'll see God care for us. As a young, as a young man, I, I saw, I, I saw uh, my, my, my dad breaking, break his back, lost his job. We had no money coming in. Listen, we went through a difficult, it was a bad year. Uh, some family members passed away. It was like one after the other. After, it, was, it, was, it was a terrible year. Uh, as far as I was concerned. And, and I can remember praying, God, why are you doing this to us? I felt like I was lying on the ground, curled up on the ball, and the devil was sitting there kicking me in the gut. Uh, it, was, it was a bad year. But you know what I saw? I saw God take care of us. I, I, saw, I, I, I saw God providing for us when we didn't have any money. I saw bills, uh, I, I heard testimonies of all the bills being paid. Uh, I saw my mom go to the grocery store and get there, and as they hand her bags of groceries or, 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 or a card or money that somebody had already get, gave to us that we didn't know about. Listen, God will take care of you, but you've got to trust him. You've got to have faith in him. You've got to ask him for that. He, he does care for you. And he'll give you the peace that passes all understanding. The last verse we're going to look at here, Matthew chapter 6, verse 25. Matthew chapter 6, verse 25. It says, Therefore I say unto you, take no thought for your life. What? I'm not supposed to think about my life? Of course I think about that. What you shall eat or what you shall drink. For some of us, that's all we think about. <laughs> Especially when I'm on a diet. Just kidding. Uh, nor yet for your body, what you shall put on. Is not the life more than meat, and the body more than raiment? Behold the fowls of the air, for they sow not, neither do they reap, nor gather into barns, yet your heavenly Father feedeth them. Are you not much better than they? Which of you, by taking thought, can add one cubit unto his stature? And why take ye thought for raiment? Consider the lily of the fields, how they grow. They toil not, neither do they spin. And yet I say unto you that even Solomon in all of his glory was not arrayed like one of these. Wherefore, if God so clothed the grass of the field, which today is and tomorrow is cast into the oven, shall not he much more clothe you, O ye of little faith? Therefore take no thought, saying, What shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or wherewithal shall we, wherewithal shall we be clothed? For after all these things do the Gentiles seek, for your heavenly Father knoweth that ye have need of all. Do you see that? He, he already knows what you need. But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things. When it says all these things, it talks about the raiment, the clothing, the food, all those physical needs it says, all these things shall be added unto you. Take therefore no thought for the morrow, for the morrow shall take thought for the things of itself. Sufficient unto today is the evil thereof. Listen, we, let's not get caught up in our worries of tomorrow. Let's, uh, uh, listen, all you'll do is you'll ruin the day that you have. As a, as a child, um, there were a few times when I got in trouble at school, uh, mostly because I did not do my homework. 
I, I was a horrible student in the third and fourth grade, uh, fifth grade, sixth grade. Uh, I was just a bad student until we were homeschooled. But well, the, the last year, half year, the sixth grade was, wasn't bad. But I can remember uh, getting, uh, we, uh, we talked about the, uh, this morning, demerits. Every time uh, you went to a Christian school, every time you got a demerit, they, they, if once you got five, they, they called a tally. When you got five demerits, you had to take the tally home to be signed by your mom and dad and then bring it back. Well, what that meant was they found out all the things that I'd done wrong over the last however long it was. I hated to tell my parents. In fact, I, I, I thought, this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to wait until, I, I would get it on Friday. It always happened on a Friday. I don't know why, but it always happened on a Friday. And so I'd wait all weekend long. And I would tell them on Monday morning, I would show it to my mom. Hey, mom, I need you to sign this before I go back to school. And she said, you know you're going to get in trouble for this, right? <laughs> when did you get home? You know what? I spent that whole, and I'd get spanked when I got home from school. I'd, I'd get in trouble. And, and they didn't beat me. They, they, they corrected me. Now, here's the question. How did I spend that entire weekend knowing that I was going to get spanked on Monday afternoon when I go home from school? Man, it ruined my weekend. All I could think about was I was sick to my stomach at times because, because of uh, the, the worry and the fear of what was to come. Listen, let's not allow ourselves to be controlled by our worries and our fears like that. Listen, confront it head on. How do, you, how do we confront it? Well, I should have confronted it by just telling my mom and dad in the first place because I did something wrong. How do we confront our worries and fears? Bring them to the Lord. Bring them to the Lord. He cares for you. The Bible says, casting all your cares upon him, for he cares for you. All right. That's two. Last one. And, well, we kind of started to talk about this one a little bit. Why do I sometimes go through trials? Man, there are trials in people's lives. And, and sometimes we wonder why would God allow me to go through this? Uh, sometimes the question is phrased, why does God allow bad things to happen to good people? Well, sometimes just bad things happen. There are bad people in the world. But the trials that happen in my life as a Christian, God allows to happen. We know that by, by looking back at the, in the book of Job. Job was a righteous man. He didn't do anything evil. He didn't do anything. He was, uh, he was uh, sacrificing. He was praying and on a daily basis. He would sacrifice for his children because uh, he was worried that they might do something wrong. And what would happen? What happened? Satan came up before God. And, 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 and God, uh, God asked Satan what he was doing. He says, walking to and fro upon the earth. And God said, God threw Job under the bus. He said, have you considered my servant Job? Why? Because he knew Job's, what Job's response ultimately would have been. There's a reason he picked Job. He had had a, he, he had, Job was a righteous man. Job had been faithful to God. And God knew that he would, in the end, that he would strengthen him and bring him to the point where he was submitted to God and saw that God was sovereign. And he would worship God and praise God even and glorify God even in his trials. And Satan said, okay, here we go. Listen, Job didn't ask for that. But what did God do through all that? He strengthened Job. He gave Job wisdom. He gave Job strength. Praise God for that. In the end, Job was better off. Now, it doesn't mean he did more than the loss of his family. Of course he did. There are times, and it's okay to mourn those things. It wasn't wrong for Job to mourn that his children were killed, that he lost everything. But he kept his focus on the Lord. Sometimes we get caught up in the trial if we forget the one who is allowing us to go through the trial. We forget that maybe he's trying to work something. Now, there are times when we're chastened, and chastened and trials are two different things. But Hebrew tells us that, that uh, Hebrews chapter 12 tells us that, that God chastens those whom he loves. If I sin, God is going to chasten me and bring me back to him as his child. He's done that in the past. I can tell you it isn't pleasant. <laughs> But he doesn't do it to punish us. There's a desire of correction to bringing us back, a reconciliation. That's why God chastens us. Trials are to strengthen us. Let's look at some. Let's look at a. Uh, let's look at a few verses. Look at First Peter chapter four.
First Peter chapter four, verse twelve. It says, "Beloved, think it not strange concerning the fiery trial which is to try you, as though some strange thing happened unto you." Listen, he says, "Don't think it some strange thing. Don't think it's something that does never that's never happened to anybody else. Why would God do this to me? He's got it out for me. No." No, it's not a strange thing. Bad things happen. The Bible says it rains upon the just and the unjust. Listen, uh, it, it, it happened. Bad things happen to us all. Let's not blame God and get upset when those things happen. Maybe we should begin to search God. Okay, well, why are you allowing this in my life? And, and maybe what can I, I learn from these things? Uh, but don't think that it's a strange thing that we go through th- these trials. In fact, uh, the, God promises us trials. Jesus never said our life is going to be easy. But he said, I was persecuted. And if they persecuted me, they're going to persecute you. Now, trials and persecution are two different things. But life isn't always going to be easy. There will be difficult times. There will be good times. But sometimes those difficult times, those trials seem to be the biggest part of our life. But it was not how it was for, for Lazarus, from Lazarus and the rich man. He was always poor. He was always hungry. He ate from the crumbs of the rich man's table. Physically, uh, he was weak and sore. Uh, had sores all over his body. The dogs would come and lick the sores of his body. Listen, that doesn't sound like somebody God's taken care of, but it was. Just because, listen, we live in America. I don't care how bad it gets here. It could be worse. I've seen, I've seen, video, or I've seen uh, pictures and videos. And, listen, I've been to third world countries and seen people living in huts. Listen, it could be worse. I don't care whether you live on Sand Hill or whether you live in Mayfair. It doesn't matter. It could be worse. You can live in a worse part of town, a worse city. You can have less. What we have is amazing compared to most of the world. The trials that we go through. You know, it could be worse. I've seen people with illnesses and people have lost family members. And Listen, I'm not saying that, to, to, that your problems and your trials aren't difficult because they're always difficult. But everybody has trials. It's not a strange thing to go through a trial in our life. In fact, if you haven't gone through one, Look out, because you're going to go through one. If you've just gone through one, look out, because here comes another one. It's just how, it's, it's how life works. But every one of those is for a purpose. And we'll get to that in a moment. First Peter chapter 1, verse 7. This is our last, our last question. On the last page, I promise, we're almost done. First Peter chapter 1, verse 7. That the trial of your faith being much more precious than of gold that perisheth, though it be tried with fire, might be found unto praise and honor and glory at the appearing of Jesus Christ. Listen, these trials that are so hard, as that are difficult to go through, I want you to understand how precious they are in the sight of God. We talked about this morning, Jesus Christ is going to come back someday, and we're going to stand before God. If we had a trial-free life, if, if we never had a problem, we would stand before God empty-handed. I want you to understand that, that he sees these things. He sees them as precious. We should see them as precious for what he's doing for us. We should see them as precious for how he works. That it might be tried with fire and found unto praise and honor and glory. See, every trial that we have is an opportunity to grow and an opportunity to glorify the God in heaven. So we can either glorify him or we can grumble about it, complain about it. I'll be the first to admit it is much easier to complain. I have found myself many times, oh, woe is me. In fact, that, that, that's very natural for me. To complain about all the struggles and, and, my, and, I, and I have to fight that. That's, that's the flesh. Uh, at my old job, uh, when I first moved to Maine, you know what they called me? Eeyore. <laughs> Why? Because I, one, I was lonely and I was out of the will of God and I was miserable. 
And I complained a lot. And I was depressed a lot. That was my attitude. But as a child of God, what should be our attitude? It should be one of, I want to glorify God regardless of what I have to go through. I want to bring honor and glory to him. James chapter 1, verses 2 and 3, we already read it. Uh, the trying of our faith, uh, we're counted on joy. It's not just precious in God's sight, but we, uh, uh, we, uh, we, and not that we should just count it as precious, but we should find joy in these trials. Because we know in the end that we'll be stronger. And in in, we know in the end we'll be more like Christ. As long as, we allow, uh, as long as we allow the Holy Spirit to work in us in that way. Because if we don't figure it out in one trial, what happens? We run into another one. God helps us to grow. He knows what's going on. Uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 10. We already mentioned this verse earlier. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 13. It says this, There is no temptation taken you, but such is common to man. But God is faithful, who will not suffer you to be tempted above that you are able. Where tempted, tempted can also be used as trials. But with, will with the temptation also make a way to escape, that ye may be able to bear it. Look also with me at Second Peter chapter 2. Verse 9. Second Peter 2 9. The Lord knoweth how to deliver the godly out of temptation and to reserve the unjust unto the day of judgment to be punished. Uh, listen, God's promise is that He can deliver us from these trials, uh, that He can deliver us uh, from, from such temptation. Uh, let's rely upon Him and lean upon Him for this. Uh, it's a promise of God, and we know that God always keeps his promises. The Bible says he cannot lie. Amen. Hebrews chapter 13. Hebrews chapter 13. Verses 5 and 6, it says this. Let your conversations be without covetousness, and be content with such things as ye have. For he saith, I will never leave thee, nor forsake thee. Praise God for that. So that we may boldly say, the Lord is my helper. I will not fear what man shall do unto me. Listen, God has promised never to leave us. It doesn't matter how we're being persecuted. It doesn't matter what the trial is. I want you to understand God is there. The old, the old poem that everybody knows, Footprints in the Sand, where he looks back at the toughest times in his life and he sees only one set of footprints. And he says, God, why did you forsake me in the toughest times of my life? And now this isn't scripture, but it, but, but it were, it's true. He says, why did you forsake me in the toughest times of my life? He says, I didn't forsake you. I was carrying you through those difficult times. Uh, listen, uh, God, God loves us. He will not forsake us. And he is our helper during those times. But we must learn to rely upon him and not upon ourselves. When we rely upon ourselves, listen, we get tired. And we fail. That's us. God never fails. God will always bring us through. Second Timothy chapter 3. Second Timothy chapter 3, we're going to be looking at verse 12. It says, Yea, and all the, that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. Listen, we might suffer persecution because of our godly life. Does that mean we should live an unrighteous life? No. But it should help us to, to learn to expect that we're going to suffer some type of persecution. Now, I understand the trials of today and the persecution of the church in the, in the New Testament were two wholly different things. They were ripped from their homes. They were, they were not able to have jobs. They were, they were not able to find food. They, they were cast into, into the arena to be fed to the animals. They were, they were killed by the gladiators. They were burnt at the stake. They, were, they watched their children be, be drowned in the rivers. Listen, they, they went through some difficult times. But that promise was good for them. It's still good for us. Amen. Understand we will go through trials. We will go through persecution. But God's promise still reigns true. 
He will never leave us or forsake us. Acts chapter 5, verse 41. Almost done. I promise only two or three more verses left. Which is good, because I don't know how much longer my voice has. Acts chapter 5 says this, And they departed from the presence of the council, rejoicing that they were counted worthy to suffer shame for his name. Well, what's happened here? Well, the apostles are, are preaching in the temple. The, uh, they've been arrested. They've been threatened. They've been uh, the, the, within an inch of their life, or their life might be taken away if they preach in the name of Jesus Christ again. And the Bible says they walked away upset and angry that God would allow this to happen to them. <laughs> no. <laughs> I was wondering how many were paying attention. That's good. And no, that's not what it says. They were rejoicing that they were counted worthy to suffer for his name. My goodness, I've always wondered how difficult it must have been for Paul and Silas to sing as they, after being beaten and thrown into the dungeon or the prison and wearing the shackles. Listen, uh, the stocks that they used to put them in, they weren't like, it wasn't like jail today where you have a, a, a cot to sit on and, and a, a toilet in the corner. And Listen, they were, they were in stocks. They, were, they weren't able to move and their backs were bleeding and raw from the beating they'd just taken and they were singing praises unto God. And I thought, how could they do that? Joy. They were counting in joy that they were able to suffer for Christ. Paul's desire was that, that I, what is it in Philippians? That I may know him, and the power of his resurrection and his suffering. He, 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 want, he had a desire to, to know Christ more and he felt and he believed and I believe it too that as we, we go through these trials that we come to know Jesus more. That we come to, 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 know, what it, uh, to know him a bit more. And, and my goodness, shouldn't that be our desire is to know him? Acts chapter, sorry, John chapter 15. John chapter 15. We're going to look at verses 18 to 22. It says, if the world hate you, you know that it hated me before it hated you. This is Jesus talking. Excuse me for a moment. If you were of the world, the world would love his own. But because you're not of the world, because I have chosen you out of the world, therefore the world hated you. Remember the word that I said unto you, the servant is not greater than his Lord. If they have persecuted me, they will also persecute you. If they have kept my sayings, they will keep yours also. But all these things will they do unto you for my name's sake, because they know not him that sent me. If I had not come and spoken unto them, they have not had sin, but now they have no cloak for their sin. Listen, if Jesus Christ was persecuted and beaten on this earth, we're not greater than he was. How much? He wasn't worthy of all that. We're getting ready to go into uh, Palm Sunday and, the, and, and, the, and Easter Sunday and, and, and focus upon what Christ went through. With he didn't deserve any of that. That was for us. And he took it. And we complain about the little things that we go through. God, why would you do this to me? He says, you don't know what I did for you. And we never forget what he's done. And we keep our eyes upon him. Seeking strength to go farther. John chapter 14. Verse 27. Go back to a few chapters of John chapter 14. Verse 27 says, Peace I leave with you, my peace I give unto you, not as the world giveth, give I unto you. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. Listen, we live in a, they lived in a day and age where they had every right to be afraid for their lives. Listen, we, uh, that, when we go through these trials, it's understandable that we can be troubled in, in these things. But Jesus said, My peace I give unto you. Uh, we, we just read it uh, uh, there in, in Philippians uh, chapter 4, uh, that we're not to, to, to worry, but instead to cast all these uh, our, our things at the feet of Christ, our requests at his feet. And, 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 and what happens? He says, the peace of God that passeth all understanding. My goodness, to be comforted with that peace. 
but he'll give it to us. It's, it's there, it's available. So what do we do? It says, uh, the question again was, why do I go through these trials? Sometimes we don't know, but it's always for our benefit. What do we do, though? Leave it to Christ. Leave it to Christ. Lean upon him. Seek him for strength. Because the truth is, if you're not in the middle of a trial right now, you will be before long. As Christians, listen, if your life is easy and flowing, and, and there doesn't seem to be any problems on the horizon and nothing on your past. Check your standing with the Lord because Satan is trying to make it easy for you. Listen, the church was never hurt by persecution. The church was never hurt by persecution. Why do I say that? Because the church only grew stronger as they were persecuted. They could not kill the church from the outside. You know how they can kill the church? From the inside. When we get fat and happy and, and comfortable, that's what will kill the church. When we, when we say, you know, everything's going good. Let's, we don't need to do anything different than what we're doing right now. Uh, it wasn't the, 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 the church there, the, the Laodicea, they were a wealthy church. They had everything. But the Bible says they're dead. It doesn't matter what we have for a building. It doesn't matter how many people we have here. If we're not leaning upon the Lord, listen, we're in trouble. Will we go through difficult times? Yeah. But let's lean on him. And let's grow through those times. Persecution, what it does is it thins the herd. I'm not calling you a herd, just to, just to get that clear. I don't, I don't really think you're livestock. What, it, what does it do? Persecution? If someone were to come in here, this is an illustration I heard as a child, and, and I've heard this true, I don't know for sure it is. Uh, there's a church in Russia during the communist days, and, and it, the, when I say church, I mean a small group of, of Christians that got together to worship God, and uh, they were there. It was in the middle of winter. The door got kicked in, and some, some soldiers came in uh, and, uh, and with, waving their guns around, and they said, listen, if you're not a Christian, get out of here because we're going to kill you all. And a few of the people scurried out, and the door shut behind them. And the soldiers said, well, now we're glad. Listen, we're not going to kill anybody. We just wanted to make sure that, that, uh, that we could worship without, without being ratted on later. They were looking for, listen, true persecution will show us who's truly following the Lord and who's not. Because when we're truly following the Lord, we'll lean upon the Lord. And let's we'll remember what he's gone through. That doesn't mean we don't fail. Goodness, we fail. Uh, in the Fox's Book of Martyrs, there's a, there's a story of a young woman who, who was tortured. She was placed upon the rack. Uh, if you know anything about what the rack was, uh, she, she was a servant. She was placed upon the rack. They, they stretch you out until your joints come out of place. Four times, and they, oh, they said, well, listen, we'll let you go if you... If you uh, if you recant, I thank you for the word. They'll uh, let you go if you recant. Four times she recanted. As soon as they let her loose, she, she, she said, listen, I only recanted because I, was, because I was in pain. It was so horrible pain. But no, I, I'm a follower of Christ. Four times they put her back on the rack. Now, there's different opinions on what happened in the end. Different accounts. One say that, that, that in the last time they ended up killing her. Uh, another says that they, they told her they wouldn't put her back on the rack because she... Uh, I don't know what the answer is, but let me tell you, we, it's that persecution that will thin us out. doesn't mean we can't struggle, but it will thin us out. But we are going to go through these trials. What do we do with them? Lean upon the Lord. Again, First Peter 5, 7, casting all our cares upon him. He cares for us. He'll bring you through. He'll never leave you nor forsake you. He'll be there right with you, right to the end. Bible says that we're, we're to, uh, in Hebrews chapter 12, that we're to, uh, uh, let's look at it real quick. This is the last verse, I promise. I, will, I think I've already said that once. I'm a Baptist preacher. What can I say? Hebrews chapter 12. It says, Wherefore, seeing we also are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which does so easily beset us, and let us run with patience the race that is set before us. Question first, is the race ever easy? No. 
especially when you talk about the race. Listen, uh, when they race on nice padded cushion, cush tracks nowadays, back when they're talking about the races back then, they're talking about the, 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 the Olympics, the original Olympics. They were cross country, mile, miles long races, and they would run for, they'd run for an uh, extremely long period. It was not easy. There were hills, there were, there were rocks. Listen, it's not going to be easy. But Christ is the one who sets that race before us. Looking unto Jesus first, to the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Now listen to this. For consider him that endured such contradiction of sinners against himself, lest you be wearied and faint in your mind. Listen, think about what he went through. Think about the struggle. Uh, uh, look at Christ. Keep your eyes upon Christ. When those trials begin to grow in your life and the, the waves be, seem like they're going to overwhelm you, think of what, about what Christ did for you on the cross. And then it says this, you have not resisted unto blood, striving against sin. Listen, you haven't gone as far as you can go. Listen, you can go a whole lot farther than you think. And God will enable you to go farther than you think. There's a movie, uh, Facing the Giants. If you've seen it, uh, there's, a, there's a scene in that movie uh, where, where the, the, kind of the, the captain of the football team is being asked to do, a, I can't remember what they're called, bear crawls or something like that with somebody on his back. What's that? The death crawl. The death crawl. So there's a crawl with another player on his back. And he says, he says Brock, was the player's name, he says, Brock, how far do you think you can go? He goes, I could probably go to the 50-yard line, coach. He goes, all right. He goes, but this time we're going to blindfold you. And he says, uh, he says, okay, he goes, I don't want you to quit when you think you've gone far enough. I want you to keep going. So we're going to blindfold you. They blindfold the young man. He picks up the other kid on his back. He gets on his knees, and uh, this death crawl is, is kind of like a bear crawl. On your hands, knees off the ground, on your feet. And with this kid on his back, holding onto his jersey. And he's going as far as he can, as far as he can, as far as he can. And he's saying, I can't do it anymore, coach. He says, you're almost there. Keep going. He's encouraging him. He's, he's trying to say, you can do it, Brock, only a little bit farther to go. And he kept going, he kept going. And when he was finally collapsed out of sheer exhaustion, he was in the end zone. Great movie. Love that movie, by the way. And if you haven't seen it, you ought to watch it. A good godly message to it. But listen to me. The, 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 the idea is this. We give up too easy. We face these trials and think, I can't do this. And listen, we can. You're right. You will fail every single time if you do it on your own. But with the strength of Christ, uh, Ephesians chapter 6, we're not going to turn there because I said we weren't going to look at it anymore. But Ephesians chapter 6 says, in, in his power, in his might, not our own. We can go through any trial. There isn't anything that this world can throw at you that God can't help you to overcome. Listen, if, if, if the, the early church fathers can stand there singing the praises of God while their flesh is burning at their legs because they're standing and tied to a stake, you can, you can praise God through your trial. One of those, one such man, I can't remember his name off the top of my head, it's in the Fox Book of Martyrs. You ought to read it sometime. There's all kinds of good information, but it's a little gory. Uh, but one of these fathers, was, one of these church fathers was standing there, uh, the flames, uh, they, they, they put too much wood on, it was so hot that, that it, wasn't, it wasn't burning fast enough, the flames weren't coming up high, and, and he was standing there singing and, and as his legs burnt off of his body, and they, they decided to end it, so they stabbed him with a, with a sword in the blood poured out of this, there are kids in here, but I'm sorry, the, the blood poured out and put the fire out. And he still sang the praises of God. I could play him a card, it'll start. Lord, why'd you do that? I'm going to be late for this. Maybe there's a reason. Somebody cut me off. <clears throat> My, listen, we can play about such a thing. If we would just trust God. There's nothing he can't bring us through. And if we count those things precious, my God, if we, if, we, if, we, if we glorify him in the midst of our trials, we'll bring honor and glory to his name. And isn't that what, in the end, again, we won't look at it, but in Ecclesiastes, isn't that what Solomon says? That we're to glorify God in heaven. I pray that we're able to do that. And that, my friends, brothers and sisters, is the last question for tonight. And I'm sorry I went so long. I didn't realize it would, well, I didn't think it would last so long. And I didn't think it would take so long. But we're done with the letter Q.